In this tutorial, we're going to go through the specific protocol that's used for the workflow in Proteome Discover to analyze um, our shotgun proteomics um, data that we collect using the LCMS in um, Proteome Discover. And so we went through in one of the previous tutorials and talked about some of the different workflows. This is an appended workflow that we've put together um, based off of some data that's in the literature. So there is, um, or I guess workflows in the literature. There's a group um, in the protein chemistry facility in Austria that have gone through and optimized um, certain portions of this workflow to increase peptide identification, to increase um, efficiency of quantification of low um, abundant pep peptides, and improving um, some of the filtering processes so that you're actually getting like good quality data that you can have confidence in um, before, before proceeding. And so when we're going through this workflow, um, a lot of the parameters that we set are defined in these three papers that I'm about to show you. So the first one, the, all of them were published in the Journal of Proteome Research. Um, this one was published in 2014. The other two were published in 2019. And um, basically they're just algorithms that can be used to improve the quality of your data. So MS Amanda, which is one of the nodes that we use, um, is similar to Mascot or Sequest. Sequest is the default um, peptide identification um, program that's used in um, Proteome Discover. And so this is a different um, algorithm that's used and basically it just helps to improve the number of peptides that you are recovering. Okay, so if you're interested in reading more about their algorithm, they go through and discuss um, the different filters and statistics that they used to design this algorithm. The next node that we're going to use um, is through the same group. So again in um, Austria or components of the same group where they're looking at um, using this method called spectral clustering to improve label-free label quantification. So because of the um, breadth of our sample sizes, we don't have the, the luxury of using um, actual tags in our samples and spiking them like a TMTplex because it would be prohibitively expensive. It's like $1,000 for 10 samples and we're running 1,000 samples. So um, that would not be feasible. So what this is doing is trying to improve ways of relatively quantifying your proteins that you get in your runs. Um, and again, you can go through and read about this, but basically what it does is it takes all of your different um, peptide fragmentations for a particular protein, and they're gonna be in different, um, the precursor ion intensity is going to be different for these different peptide fragments. And so basically it takes all those different spectra um, and clusters them together. And it does this across your sample. So if you have one sample that has really low um, intensity and another sample where you have really high abundance of this protein, it can align them based on various parameters of the run um, and help you to identify ones that are lower abundant in some samples. And then finally, we use this algorithm called AppQuant, um, which helps to improve your label-free quantification by going through a series of um, filtering processes. And again, you can go through and read about um, some of the, the filters that they apply. Basically what they do is they take platforms that have been built um, by multiple different groups and basically kind of combine the filtering of them all. And so that you're, you're taking the advantageous parts of each of these methods and kind of putting them together to improve um, what kind of data you're getting. So, most of what I'm going to be talking about in terms of the setting come from these three papers. And so if you have or will use this analysis um, for your proteomics work, these are going to be um, critical references that you'll want to look at um, and go through to understand what um, workflow is used to generate your data. So let's switch over to Here. So we talked in a previous tutorial about this is a typical output um, data file for one of the studies that I run where you have your 
460 proteins roughly um, in each of their area abundances for each of my 10 samples. And then data about which samples they were found in and what method they were used for identification. And I can look at information about each of their different um, peptide spectra and see which peptides um, were used in the quantification or that were found in the samples and how confident they were. So I can get a better idea of kind of what, what my data set looks like before I move on. So to get to this point, um, if you remember, we set up a study definition, right? And so in this, I was looking at my baseline, baseline app quant study. Again, I have all my study factors that are shown here. Um, I have all of my various different input files that I've put in um, and then defined what different treatments there were using the samples tool. And then I have all of the different analysis results I've run for um, this particular study. So if I wanted to go back in and open up the study and look at it, I can do this a couple ways. I can right click on it and go to reprocess or I can just click reprocess up here um, and go to all analysis steps. And what's gonna happen is it's gonna open up the study that I ran. So you can see now that there's two extra tabs um, that I have here. And so we want to go into our workflows tab, workflow tabs. And so we're going to um, go through and talk about what's happening in each of these different nodes. You can see that this workflow is a little bit more convoluted. And again, it's based off of um, the data that we found in the literature. Um, a lot of this was put together by Yareli Alvarez when she was doing her master's pro project. Um, and so she kind of started us on this path of using this for an analysis. You can see right now in my workflow, I have um, an error message. And the reason for that is because I updated the name of my FASTA file um, the other day. And so when I reload this, it's not going to show up because it's under a different name now. So I'm going to have to put that back in, but we'll go through that. So walking through this again, you have your spectrum files. This basically just inputs your spectrum files. Um, that you're going to process. Your spectrum selector takes them and then further processes them. So for the spectrum selector, basically what we're telling the program that we want to do is that it's going to take the MS1 precursor. And so when you do <clears throat> your full MS for every group of ions, for every M over Z that's getting um, sent in and analyzed by the mass spec, you have your um, different isotopic peaks. And so this is going to take that precursor ion um, for whatever MS1 you have, and it's going to use that to um, continue with the processing. We have set here, these are all default, so you could change them if you wanted to. Um, so our minimum precursor mass is going to be 350 Daltons. Um, the maximum is going to be 5,000 Daltons. You can, again, change this if you're looking for something in particular. Um, you can set where your mass analyzer and all of this are, but none of it really matters for the processing, okay? Um, so these are all just kind of default parameters. What happens next is we go through one of two steps. So the first one we want to do um, is perform the peptide identification search, and we're going to use MS Amanda again instead of um, Sequist or Mascot. So in this, we need to specify a protein database that it's going to use to make peptide spectral or make theoretical um, fragmentation patterns for different peptides, okay? Um, and so I want to tell this to use Middleus. And again, because I didn't have a protein database set here, it's going to tell me that I need to reprocess everything because I've changed something. Now that I've had this um, in, I have all of the components to actually run this and my method would work again. So your protein database is important. I'm going to tell it that um, I want to use trypsin as my um, enzyme to do the digestion. I'm going to allow for three missed cleavages. The default is two. Um, so this is just kind of preference. In terms of your um, MS1 tolerance, 
This was set in the um, parameters for this paper. So this is what this group recommends using when you're running MS Amanda, which is um, 7 ppm, and then your fragment mass tolerance would be 0 0.03 Daltons, um, which is a little different than what you use in Sequist. And again, we have our static and dynamic um, modification. So we have a carbon, carbon meth I can never say this. Um, Carbamidomethyl group on the cysteine residues, um, an oxidation on methionine, which is a dynamic modification, and then an N terminal acetyl group um, that's also going to be dynamic. And it's going to use these B and Y ions from the fragmentation pattern to actually um, come up with this theoretical peptide um, match list for your particular species. And so again, the way that this works is if there's um, 10,000 protein sequences in the NCBI database, it will take each one of those amino acid sequences. It will look for all of the places where trypsin cleaves the peptides into fragments, and it will come up with different peptide fragmentation patterns for every single protein in that data set. And it's going to use that to match up what um, you actually generated by fragmenting um, your peptides um, in the QExacto Plus and align those together to um, identify proteins, okay? From there, we go into percolator. And percolator um, basically improves your ability to identify proteins. Um, and so what it does is after things are once it's found the peptide spectrum matches, um, it kind of eliminates those from the search and then it goes back and reprocesses the ones that don't have a match and sees if it could find something. So um, it kind of continues to go through this. Um, you can change some of these parameters for, parameters for your false discovery rates, um, but these are the defaults and is what is recommended in those other programs. In terms of our spectral clustering node, so again, you can see what it's doing is taking intensity um, of all of your different peaks and clustering um, things together. So again, you're going to set your precursor tolerance. This comes from that particular paper where you want five parts per thousand. Your fragment tolerance is going to be 0 0.02 kilodaltons. And then um, the only other parameter that we change in this is that we apply a mass filter of M over Z of 150. And I couldn't really find a good description of what this means, but my understanding is that it just eliminates anything that has smaller than um, an M over Z of 150 from your, your data set. For your spectral cluster search, um, this is where we start to set the parameters of what we want to use for identification. Um, and so you have multiple different levels of things that are happening here um, and different levels of confidence at each of these different steps. So in this case, what it's looking for is um, how confident are you that that one peptide match um, was actually correct, right? So the theoretical versus um, your predicted sequence, you might have variation in amino acid sequences in those. So how confident are you that those are actually the same pep peptide fragment? We're gonna go with medium. You can change this to low. Um, the consensus ID threshold and minimum identifications, um, these are the default settings. So the confidence filter is the only thing I change here. Um, and just to note, I did run um, this protocol changing everything to low as a confidence filter. And I ended up, despite not having um, the data having it run against any other database than Middleist, but I identified like 10,000 bacterial and virus genes in these samples. So um, it's important to be kind of strict on these because you're just gonna generate a lot of data that you don't want or don't necessarily need. In terms of your fixed value PSM validator, um, these are just the default settings. And so the last one we need to consider here is our um, imp app quant. And so again, this is going to help us to perform our um, quantification. And so it's going to take the area of that MS1 precursor. Again, we wanted to have um, a minimum confidence of medium to actually continue with this processing step. And it's going to use this MS Amanda score that was generated up here. Um, 
as an indication of whether that's medium confidence. Again, you have your mass tolerance set, so these are all defined in the study. Um, it's going to match between runs. So in all of these different samples, it's gonna to try to find uh, matches and correct for changes in retention time, um, which you can set the retention time tolerance of how um, much leeway you wanna give, depending on your samples. So if you know that you're getting a lot of drift over time, this may be something that um, you might consider changing. Um, how many missing peaks you have. And then again, your different conf confidence um, parameters. The score components to use um, is defined in or described in more detail in the AppQuant primary literature in the um, supplemental data. These were the um, parameters that I was told that we should run um, by Gerhard. Um, and so you should look into these so that you have a better idea of what um, what data is actually going into you determining the area of any given peak. Okay, so those are the specific parameters um, for this processing step. And most of the ones that we changed that I pointed out are things that need to get a, um, described when you are writing this up um, for publication. And you can see, I forget where it went, but on one of these it said to make sure that you cite these papers if you're using their nodes, so don't forget to do that. Um, in terms of the consensus step, there's not a lot that we change here. So for the MSF files, um, this is just taking the files from that previous step and um, gonna continue with the processing. And so it's gonna go with anything that was identified or quantified, and then basically everything else is gonna get thrown out. In terms of our um, peptide spectra spectral match grouper, it's going to group anything that was redundantly identified into peptide groups. Um, so that's one of those different nodes that you have there. So you have your peptide spectral matches and there's multiple of those that will go for a given peptide. Um, and then those peptide groups will feed into your protein groups and so on and so forth. For your peptide validator, um, again, this is where you want to set your false discovery rates. Um, by default, the strict is always 99%. Um, Confidence, so you're allowing for a 0.01% error, um, and then your relaxed is 0.05. You can be more strict or lenient on these if you want to, but I would leave them as is. The only, um, or one of the only things I change in this node is again, if I look at my peptide confidence, again, because we're using a non-model organism, I wanna use allow a little bit more leeway, and so I changed this to medium so that um, it's actually giving me the data for anything that had medium confidence or higher. It's gonna get rid of anything that had lower confidence. Um, you can adjust what the minimum peptide length is. Um, and so, and then in terms of protein filters, I changed this to two. And so I have to have at least two separate peptides for it to be identified as a protein in this result file, because I wanna make sure that, um, again, I can be a little bit more confident in the peptide or the protein identifications that we're getting. Um, and so that gets changed. In terms of protein score, there are no parameters. For your protein false discovery rate validator, again, you just have your confidence thresholds that you set. Um, and then for protein grouping, we apply strict parsimony principle. So that's true. Um, and then finally, we are going to set the parameters for our quantification ratios. Um, and so the peptides that it's going to use, you can change this and there's descriptions down here of um, what each of these different factors mean, but we're gonna use um, the unique peptides per protein group for calculation of the protein error they need to have a medium confidence. And what we use um, as a method for doing this is what's known as IBAC. And so the IBAC um, is going to take the total intensity of um, all of the peptides that you identify and then divide it by that one particular protein. So it's just um, a method for using protein intensity for label-free quantification. Um, and this is what they use in that study. Our grouping method is going to be to sum them together. 
and none of these other parameters get changed. They're just kind of set in from other parts of your processing node. So if I were to go and run this now, again, this is going to give me this output where I have all of my different um, app quant data. Um, and so one thing to note when you get here is just because this generates data for you doesn't mean that it's usable, right? So this has gone through and it's kind of done the first step, which is lining up all your peptide spectrum matches, grouping them together, annotating what the proteins probably are based off various different scores um, from the MS Amanda and how confident you can be um, based on all of those parameters that we set. In some cases, um, oh, I just saw one. Some of your peptides or proteins won't show up in every sample. And so if you have something like this, this only showed up in one of my samples. Um, and it's actually, you can see from photobacterium. So there was a bacterial infection in one of my samples. This isn't something that I would want to use um, in my analysis. And so you need to go through and kind of filter out any of the junk that's in there. Um, and one thing about the way that the quantification works is that you're quantifying each, um, you're quantifying precursor ions in multiple different sequences. And so if I go into my peptide groups, let's go to copper zinc, um, Superoxide dismutase, which is a protein that's interesting to us. You can see that one of my um, biological replicates, it didn't show up in, um, which is fine. But it showed up in the rest of them. And so if I were looking at this for which ones I would want to use for quantification, what you're going to be doing to get that full protein group, um, this value up here, is basically you're taking data from each of these um, quantifications that you've done, right? So I've calculated whatever the area was of each of the different precursor ion peaks for all five of these um, peptide fragments. You can see too, if I look at this, these two are basically the same fragment. This one's just a little bit longer, right? And so I need to be able to go through and look at differences in the area um, of these curves to to, and set certain parameters to say, okay, I actually want to use this. To get an area for a protein, it's best to have at least two um, of these peptide fragments that you're fairly confident you're getting good data from. Of course, the values aren't going to match up every time because you're running multiple different samples, you have different fragment lengths. Um, and so the algorithm again goes through and sums all these up, but you're going to go through and do some post-processing where I'd probably want to throw out this one if it was used because it didn't show up in very many of my samples, right? And so that's not really going to give me um, good data that I want to include in my data set. So once you've generated this, you need to go an additional step. What you can do is go into file and go to export. And you can export, I like to do to a tad delimited, um, and you're going to want to do the protein and the PSMs. You can download other data too, but you have this. And you can see that you're going to generate a text file that has um, our friendly headers. And so if I go to export, it's going to give me this and then I can import it into R. The reason that this is important, let me pull this up. Um, is After you run this analysis, you now need to do all of your post processing in this program called Lima. And Lima was designed for um, transcriptomics, but it's also been applied as it talks about in this paper um, to other platforms, including proteomics. Um, and so there are steps in the analysis that you can use. This program has a lot of capacity for analyzing your data, um, but basically it's running a series of linear models on each protein across samples and then for your entire data set um, to help you look at um, differential expression. So you'll need to go through once you have all of your samples, filter out data that you don't want, normalize all of your data, 
log transform it, and then you can actually run the statistical analysis in this. So that is how we do our, I guess, processing of our proteomics data.